All right, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, this is great. Um, we're really excited to be here to talk about our uh, journey toward accessible ETDs. And uh, yes, this was an Ohio link uh, mandate that we had to uh, put forth, but it's also something we've been working on for a long time. So I, um, I'm actually Cindy Kristoff. I think I show up as Cynthia in the program, but I prefer Cindy. And I am the Ohio Link ETD administrator for Kent State, but that's just one of the hats that I wear. I uh, am actually the uh, copyright and scholarly communications. So this is just one of the tasks that I do. And I have with me today uh, Virginia Dressler, our digital projects librarian, and Allison Haynes, uh, our IT compliance coordinator. Um, so I will. Um, don't know if you guys want to introduce yourselves a little bit more or, okay, all right, that's all right. Okay, accessibility is part of DEI, and uh, this has been an eye-opening thing uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, with uh, DEI, we've added A onto the end of it at Kent State, so we have DEIA, uh, because accessibility is an integral part of DEI. Um, there's a quote from the Reverend Jesse Jackson, which I thought was really good. Inclusion is not a matter of political correctness, it's the key to growth. And I think we've had a lot of conversations amongst ourselves, and the essential thing is to bring everybody on board so we have all the brain power that we need. We don't want to leave anybody behind because that leaves us all behind. Um, so this is an important value for me. Um, within the libraries, uh, the university libraries, uh, we've had a uh, Digital Accessibility University Libraries Committee that was initiated in 2019. And I can't say that it was exactly well received at first. We sort of had to push it a little, right? Because people didn't really see the value of digital accessibility right away. Uh, so this is something that's um, been uh, mostly Jenny that's been fighting for it. Um, but within the university, um, our first enterprise level focus on, was on full website redesign in 2014. So it does go back a little ways. The first hires of accessibility specialists took place in 2018. And uh, the digital accessibility compliance coordinator position uh, moved to the division of information technology in 2020. So we have Allison here. So these are all key positions uh, within this. So, um, accessibility as part of DEI. Um, we have services, documentation, and education. Um, standard printed materials, scanned documents, born digital documents, and um, this is all central to our standard operations. I think that it's really key when you have something that we're scanning it seems like a, a more uphill battle, whereas when you're uh, giving birth, quote unquote, to a digital document, you have the opportunities there to incorporate accessibility as you go along. So there's a, a little mix of both in our operation. So we have been doing some retrospective thesis and dissertation scanning and remediation. Uh, since 2017, my unit, the Digital Projects Unit, has been digitizing TV requests on demand from interlibrary loan. Um, so to date, that's just a little over 130 requests um, from 20, probably mid-2017, I didn't keep track of dates when we kicked it off, um, to this month. Um, we did have the hiccup in um, you know, spring and summer of 2020 when the interlibrary loan wasn't um, processing any physical requests. Um, but outside of that, uh, we've been doing these just as they come through with the ILL queue. Um, previously, print titles were um, snail mail to patrons. Um, so I just made a really small note that I feel like this also supports screen initiatives in libraries, reducing the missions to not have to snail mail content. And a shout out to Ben Goldman at Penn State, who did a really amazing greenhouse gas emission report from their university library system, which is incredible. It came out last year. Next slide. Uh, so our print copies are scanned to our benchmarks for preservation scanning. Uh, we send an access copy to the um, patron. Uh, these are heavily compressed and OCR'd. Um, then we take the full resolution scans. Uh, we prepare these for Ohio Link um, to their specs with the PDF A1B. Uh, we diskew and crop the um, individual TIFF images, redact the signatures, 
Um, and then we run this through uh, remediation using Acrobat Pro, using the accessibility check tool. Um, current hiccups in our workflow, uh, tables are hard and they are <laughs> all over TVs. Um, and we also had some uh, musical scores that we had some interesting issues with as well. Okay, thank you, Jenny. So within OhioLink, um, the OhioLink Accessibility Statement uh, came out in March of 2021. And there's a link to that and you can read it. It's a lot longer than these three statements, but it just reaffirms OhioLink's commitment to uh, ongoing improvement of, of inclusivity and accessibility with its shared collections. So this isn't just with ETDs, it's with vendors as well. Um, but Ohio Lake is in Columbus. I'm not sure how many of you know this. Ohio Lake is in Columbus and um, Ohio State is in Columbus. So uh, administratively, Ohio Link is under Ohio State for some things and accessibility is one of those things. So Ohio State has a minimum digital accessibility standards policy and uh, we're uh, using uh, the procedures and workflows that OSU provides. So this kind of uh, comes down from that. Um, and also, uh, of course, the, the central office continues to work with the vendor platforms and hopefully we'll, we'll get there at some point. Okay, so ETDs at Kent State University are under the graduate college and we have our uh, Dean Manfred Van Dolman. He's not just uh, the Dean of the graduate college, he's also an associate provost. He wears a lot of hats too. Um, but what we started was an initiative, how are we gonna meet with the Ohio Link standards? How are we gonna get there? Because that deadline is January 23rd. Um, so I had talked with Manfred and he said, you have all my support, whatever you wanna do. So I originally put out a call to a lot of people around campus and I said, do you wanna be involved with this? Allison was the only one who responded. And I thought, well, okay. I didn't know that part. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you now, you're learning so new things. So I was the sucker. <laughs> you were the sucker. But I'm very happy she did. And because what we did actually was leverage um, the uh, a system that was already in place. And you can put the next slide. And those are the gatekeepers. Um, Kent State has a lot of uh, colleges and a lot of regional campuses, seven or eight, I forget the number now, but seems to change. Uh, but the college gatekeepers or ETD contacts are the ones that review the ETDs for the college. So they're the ones that have in their hands the style guides. Um, they know the style of the university. They know the requirements. Um, so they review and approve the ETDs. I'm the ETD administrator, so I really don't get called unless a student has a mistake and they contact me and I refer them along, or if something technical goes wrong, and I'm able to solve a lot of the technical issues that are in the Ohio Link ETD. Some of them I have to contact Emily Flynn at Ohio Link for, but usually I can rescue whatever the situation is um, and save everybody from panic. Um, but what we decided to do, Alice and I, was work with students and, and their, well, the, the gatekeepers work with students and advisors in the individual colleges. So we thought rather than getting a bunch of other people onto this committee, let's work with what's already in place. So we've got these gatekeepers. It's been smooth running for now for since 2014. I didn't invent the gatekeepers. Uh, this was uh, something that was put in place when the ETD came about in the mid 2000s. So. A um, little bit of background though on numbers. Um, we have a total of uh, 4,645, this is of yesterday, uh, Kent State ETDs uh, from the very start of the Ohio Link ETD Center in the mid 2000s. Uh, we average about 620 per year. Now I will say that it was more like 650 to 675, but COVID put a little bit of damper and it's dragging those stats down. But this is the average over the last 10 years. So this is what we're looking at. Um, among our gatekeepers, uh, one of our favorites, uh, who is the gatekeeper for the uh, College of Education and Human, and Human, there's a longer name, but it's really the College of Education. And she's been a gatekeeper for a very long time. She's a real perfectionist, a very hard worker, very detail oriented. And she raised her hand and volunteered and said, I'll be the test college. Because we thought before the January 2023 deadline, we'd better test this out. So how are we going to do this? Well, EHHS is actually really 
a complex college with 25 master's degrees, 14 doctoral programs, um, and they range in topics. So there's everything from hosp hospitality to physical education to educational administration, just a lot of different um, topics. Um, so our gatekeeper uh, provided 20 example theses and dissertations with different research methodologies. So these look different, have different illustrations, have different tables, you know, our favorite thing, tables, and have images in them uh, for a variety of presentation of data, both qualitative and quantitative. She really tried to give us a good overview of what's in there. So um, our test college uh, has uh, e education, health, and human services has approximately 15 ETDs per semester. And most of them are doctoral, but we do have some theses in there too. Um, so we met with the gatekeeper, the assistant dean, and uh, uh, we're going to be meeting with uh, the services Back in the olden days, like my mother-in-law used to be a typist for College of Worcester and she'd get out the ruler and measure the margins. Well, now we've got editing people and work processing and proofreading people. So we're going to bring them into the loop too, as well as the graduate students who are involved uh, with graduating this semester. And this is going to be a voluntary thing. We're not going to have them required to make their ETD accessible, but we're hoping to test out our training materials and all those things on this group of students. So we met uh, on Tuesday, uh, just the other day, to talk about training within the college, uh, what we'll have. Uh, and actually, Allison will be talking a lot more about this. But we're going to have written instructions, video instructions, and some face-to-face -face assistance, too. We'll evaluate this in December as fast as we can. And then we need to launch it to the entire campus in 2023. So I actually think what we're going to start doing is this in October. It's it's not going to be something we can wait on doing. We have to get the information out to the other gatekeepers, knowing that we're going to find out some things that we don't know yet, and we will communicate to them for the next uh, year for 2023. Um, so I think this is where yeah, I can take over for roll comes in. Passing. Thank you. Very much. Come. Thank you. So I'm learning just from the little bit of time of being here today that um, these workflows are coming from many different places on campus for all of us. There's connections with different offices and, and divisions. Um, we do have the, the luxury of um, a couple of full-time employees at the digital accessibility team um, and then a few students. So we are not engaged in active remediation. We are engaged in actively teaching people how to do the stuff they need to do. And so we have I mean, a huge digital footprint uh, for Kent State, um, 300,000 web pages, um, massive LMS. We brought over 150,000 courses into our new LMS this year. And so as I'm working my way through then um, to kind of ensure that each group that has accessibility needs is kind of advancing the level of their accessibility. Working with the library then has been um, absolutely great. In fact, I think they've been one of our, our strongest partners across campus. And there is no single unit that we connect with. Um, so we're working on, on um, moving for the accessibility of, of all the electronic resources platforms with one group and uh, digital projects with another. And then um, now I'm much more aware of the ETD world. So I uh, didn't put it on the slide, but my first step then was what Cindy mentioned, which was to take a look at um, the sample theses, try to get a feeling for what we were looking at, because I've got in my head what I, I consider accessible. Uh, Ohio Link is, is actually giving us quite a bit of grace on what they're saying we need to consider accessibility to be. So we are choosing not to take a hard line with this, but to take an educational line in one that really touts the professional benefits for each of these students learning how to do this. So as we scanned through those, I realized the wonderful part, which is that um, all of their, they were being trained to make their figure descriptions uh, even more descriptive than alt text would have been. So that's become a central part of our messaging, uh, aligning with Ohio Link, and then now kind of determining what we're going to say our ETD standards are. Um, so what we're trying to do then is create self-sufficiency at, at each level because we do not want anyone to feel like this is kind of landing on them. 
Um, so that's that's been a big part of kind of our motivation in making decisions by reviewing those theses and dissertations and determining you know what the biggest holes might be from accessibility standpoint, and then determining how what we're going to expect of students, what's logical and realistic with the short time frame, but then also what what's scalable. How long you know if we're going to be keeping at this for five years, you know we've kind of collectively made the decision that you know if we're thinking about the next five years, we'd rather put in significant focus time now and, and do plenty of quality control and plenty of uh, conversations with people and, and figure it out now and do it well and then see if it can sustain largely sustain itself then um, throughout. So what we're doing is, you know, you're a very education focused kind of concept here. So we're going to we're going to do multimodal, which is such a huge part of accessibility anyway. Um, we need the 24 seven aspect nature of it. Um, for some reason, uh, graduate students don't seem to always work between eight and five. So we need them to have access to this information at all times. Uh, this is one of the parts of the world where, or in our worlds, where a printed tip sheet actually still has value as the students are coming into the office and we're handing it out to them or the gatekeepers would be at least in each college. And then, so my team and I have narrowed down what we want to focus on, the, the three things or so that we want to uh, focus on for the students. So all of that content is going to go into these three places. Slightly different presentation of content in each one, but we're going to make sure that it is as clear as possible. So um, please do not mistake this presentation as us saying to you, we have been hugely successful with this process for 10 <laughs> years, and we're here to report all of our victories. This is all just happening. I mean, literally, I finished this yesterday the first one that we're going to start rolling out. So we're going to see where it goes. But um, my position when, when they moved it over to IT was very focused on um, being someone who inspires people towards greater accessibility as opposed to the punitive aspect of we're doing this to escape a lawsuit, which is what my predecessor's position had been more focused at. Um, so we're choosing to do things um, that really help the student feel like and help the gatekeeper feel like they're part of something cool and bigger than they are. So I don't know if you can read that, but we're saying things, thank you graduate student for your efforts to upload accessible ETDs. You are joining thousands of other students across Ohio. I have no idea how many actually, we're just putting thousands uh, down. <laughs> Working to comply with state and federal standards for academic resources, therefore ensuring equal access to the results of your hard work and academic discipline for all future readers below are the steps so we're really trying to make this not sound academic we're trying to connect with them as humans as opposed to incredibly smart people we want them to really buy into this as a person instead of buying into it as kind of a um, mandatory academic duty kind of thing um, we're going to make it look like Kent State stuff. If you can't tell from the upper right-hand corner, we've got um, our same coloring, same uh, fonts, this kind of thing. And then we're doing plenty of things. Uh, you can, If you can see, number six and seven in the screenshot above, we're doing plenty of things to make the different parts of it stand out. That's really important for um, people with cognitive disabilities to be able to figure out what it is they're looking at and what they're supposed to do. So all of the italicized and slightly bolded stuff is actually what you click in Word and what you click in, in Adobe and those types of things. And then the really bold stuff are the steps you need to follow. Um, instead of worrying about listing, I think the reason, the way we get into these huge long documents academically is we, we try to think of absolutely everything that any one person might need to know and then we end up with a 15 page paper. Um, so we have the luxury of kind of focusing more of an IT approach, which is we're gonna, we're gonna uh, speak to and we're gonna address the, the main flow and then we're gonna give them a way to connect to people if they have questions. So that's where the QR code comes in with who you're then going to uh, who you're then going to talk to. So that's kind of what we're looking at. As you can tell, we're just in the very baby stages of all of this, but, um, and, and there's nothing streamlined about it. It's been, you know, hour long conversations in which we just kind of bounce ideas off each other with yeah. the deans, with the three of us, what makes sense, and just hugely emphasize, or um, influenced by kind of the strategy each of us employ personally and the standards that we have for our own work and then how we're going to bring that to this. So yeah, that's that's where we're at. 
So we can take any questions and we may have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I was looking online for um, digital accessibility standards. From was, Ohio Link? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like at 2.0. Mm -hmm. right? um, those are really high standards for content. And I think we all would love to be able to post uh, content at that level. Um, but, you know, realistically, it's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, go forward is easier, back to back five is hard, and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. So I, I give really great, you know, accolades to you guys for working through setting this up. But who, and also the other kind of part of this is that a, a sure look at 2.0 is usually requires a lot of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys, Realistically, needing to look at 2.0, and so it's really this magic, right? Because <laughs> it's a lot of work. Where do you have a set of standards that are almost there that are acceptable enough? I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, what is enough if what I really is? Yeah, sure. So we all know in here accessibility is never a, a Boolean kind of thing. It's never on, off, or, you know, light, dark, this type of thing. Um, and my approach is very highly um, uh, tailored. I teach people to curate their content. I teach them to triage their needs and the kind of um, volume that we all have, um, focusing on I feel like it's the best use of, of our limited time and resources to focus on the big picture. So that means I'm going to get in and I'm going to really focus on uh, putting together the Ohio Link requirements with what I think the first level of, of teaching students would be. And so my digital accessibility specialist and I have gone through and then compiled the biggest chunks, like the biggest red flags that we think are going to come through in an ETD. So for us, we're starting by, and this is like the last minute push for students, not the ones who are ongoing. We'll teach them to do some stuff with headings and we'll teach them some other things. But what I noticed in most of the theses is that there are clickable table of contents. So those often will have the headings already built into them a little bit. So I'm gonna kind of lean on that for a little bit since we're doing a minimum viable product kind of thing at this point. Um, so we're teaching them to, um, review their completed document, make sure that their figures are accurately explained, either right under as a caption or in the surrounding paragraphs. So we're skipping the whole worrying about if we're going to have massive reading of formulas and tables and just trusting that it's, it's a teaching them to, to pull it together in there. We're going to teaching them to export um, with the, the accessibility box checked and all the specifics of how that could look in Windows and Mac. Then when they come into Adobe, we've literally gone through and done screenshot by screenshot, pulling those highest level Ohio Link standards and making those be the ones that we check. We're not getting into tagged PDFs yet. We cannot. That is too huge of an undertaking with too high of a level of expertise and frankly, too much of an ask of these students and gatekeepers who are already completely inundated with information and specificity of everything under the sun. So we're starting with some of those higher level concepts um, and, and we're moving from there. I chose early in my tenure to not lose sleep over every single WCAG detail, but to approach it from an educational standpoint. How can I make sure that whatever I'm choosing to focus on is going to have the largest impact? And, and for that then, we're, we're looking at the alt text, we're looking at um, some of the other key things, making sure they get a title on the language of set, some of the other stuff like this. So it's, um, I take full responsibility, my team and I, for the decisions we've made, and now we'll just roll it out and see how it goes. Can I ask you to, um, uh, apparently the audience, virtual audience, is not able to hear even with this microphone, so any questions that they could be 
be repeated. Sure. Um, and then we have um, one question in the chat um, from Shirley. So she wants to know if you can make those training materials accessible so that we could see slash hear them. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do. We, um, I was just in the process of looking for where I saved the PDF, not that any of you have inappropriate naming conventions or anything, but I was looking for it on mine. Um, and I'm going to load that up and kind of show you what we're starting with. Um, any other questions while I'm kind of pulling that up? I may need to repeat the question. Okay, so... This part gets a really long voice in the um, You mentioned the key um, pieces you're worrying about all text. And then I don't know if I turned off or, or if you just kind of let go. What, what are of all of the pieces parts? What are the ones that you feel are the most important to think about for immediately? All text, OCR, or what else? So I guess I can answer part of this. I'm not the technical person, really. Um, but I will say that Ohio Link standards are very um, basic at the Oops. moment. Mm -hmm. And what they're telling us is that you need to have H1 for your headings and then any kind of alt text for images. Um, one thing, and Alice, this is probably Allison's line, but we found in reading the sample uh, theses and dissertations that students have actually described what's in their images really well within the text itself. So whatever all text is needed may already be there and that's a good sign. Um, did I do that right? You did. All right. You did. And so, legally with WCAG, that's what the situation is, is that you, you need to have sufficient alt text or you need to have an ARIA, ARIA label if you are not sufficiently explaining, so the screen reader is going to come through and it's going to read all the text that is OCR'd on there. And as long as you've covered things well, then it's probably going uh, to definitely meet uh, alt text standards. But like as far as alt text tags, you know, about tagging. Right. So we're not going to worry about tagging yet because, frankly, when you get into tagging, some of these specific things we're teaching them to do in Acrobat, it wipes the slate clean whenever you come in and do tags. So we're going to start with things simply because Ohio Link is only asking for an H1, which is a title. So we have no onus at this point to teach headings coming down into the twos and threes. So you can see on the screen now we're asking them to uh, export it as a PDF and check uh, the one box. You can see in number three, we're using visuals to say, okay, you're starting in Word. Then you're going to go from Word to Adobe by exporting, and this is exactly what it's going to say. Um, and, you know, Windows or Mac, we've done a lot of quality control this week. And then this is what you're going to want to do in, in the, uh, Adobe. And my partner and I know that program inside and out. And so we have thought through all of this, what's going to be the most honestly palatable for the students and still get us the strongest results. So we are teaching them to open the accessibility checker that is part of the plugin with Pro to run the accessibility check. And then we have literally told them to choose the options here um, that are appropriate for the Ohio Link standards. And we've gone through and checked what those are. So we can't have image only PDF. Duh, we have to have the text language. We have to have the document title. And then that accessibility permission flag is what's set when it's coming out of Word. So if you, if you understand accessibility at all, you know that these are really bare minimum standards. And that's a relief because I, I got to think about the entire campus. There is no group except I can think of like one or two groups that things are at a technical level where I'm teaching headings uh, at the, for, for a significant PDF kind of thing like this. Yeah. Yeah, and so when, we, when we're sure that it's not going to cause us trouble with real people, we're going to share this with Ohio Link and then hopefully to you as well. Um, two questions. Uh, one, will you be sharing this document with those conference materials? Once we find out if they work. So give us the pilot group first and let us modify, and then we'll have some real data to see if, if it's going to be effective. And then we'll modify as necessary. And that was for Roxanne, so in case, because she's not here and what I'm, uh, what I'm going out. Um, so the second question, and we'll go to the live 
uh, question. Um, and it's, it's, you'll repeat this for Erica. Um, are you planning on incorporating formal alt text at a later time? So the question is, are we planning on um, adding in formal alt text requirements at a later time? That depends on what I see from the sample theses and dissertations that come in from the other colleges. Um, the first thing I noticed was that there was already solid figure descriptions being made. I looked into their style guide to see if that was part of the style guide. It was not, which means we've gotten lucky with the supervising uh, chairs in which they're teaching them to do the figure stuff correctly. I kind of doubt our luck is going to hold, um, but we still think it's more effective to teach the solid figure descriptions in this context. You know, if we're creating social media or we're throwing an image onto a web page, well, duh, then teaching a simple alt text is going to be a lot easier. In this situation, we might as well kill two birds with one stone by making sure that they're doing descriptive figures, and then we meet the legal requirements. I just had a quick follow-up to the earlier answer on that question. Um, how are you providing the answers to the ACTEC code for all your students? <laughs> oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> The question is, how are we providing access to Acrobat Pro for all of our students? So, um, we are in the process of becoming an Adobe campus. That's my answer. So, that means we, uh, my division is in negotiations with Adobe right now on, on standardizing, pricing, this type of thing. Um, and before too long, we will make that available for them. Now. We didn't think that was going to be the case when we started brainstorming with this. So we were thinking our way around several things. Number one, uh, making sure that each of the gatekeepers had access to it, having them put pressure on their budget people to say, give me, just give me a subscription. It's not going to be that much, you know, hundred bucks, give me a subscription. Um, or moving towards um, a concentrated week that we focused on uh, accessibility with the completed documents and having all the students do that seven day free trial with Adobe in which they just run it through then and then they pull back out. Um, so that's something that we've talked about. Um, and I think we're going to squeak through with kind of being able to avoid the <clears throat> what if you don't have Adobe kind of thing. Um, I don't think it. There you go. It's fifteen dollars for the continuing four week, the next four weeks. So there's five five weeks for fifteen bucks, which has to be one of their lower expenses for their theses and dissertations, anyway. But it's been very important to us to not mentally take on all of the responsibility of this on ourselves. To be thinking from the get go, the student is the one who's applying for the degree. The student has the onus of making the document correct. The student has the onus of purchasing the technology that they need to purchase in order to do this. But doggone it, we're going to be with you every step of the way. We'll teach you how to do it. We'll be there for you. That kind of thing. Sorry, you want some? I'm sorry. Um, I would like to follow on, like, you know, taking care of that question of the OB at that part. Um, can Microsoft Word do accessible OB chatting? And if so, so, is there a limitation? And if not, um, do you see any other software that could be used instead of the Adobe? Okay, so I'll send you to the Ohio link. You'll just need to Google Ohio link um, accessibility ETD, something along those lines, and you'll get to their chunk of pages. There is another recommendation there. I'm not remembering it off the top of my head. Um, there are you know, the entire Microsoft suite has solid accessibility, checkers, reminders, all of these types of things. There are things you can do in there. However, because we're so deep into this field, my team and I have thought about the, the strengths and weaknesses of both Adobe and Word in light of what a student's going to have the mental bandwidth to be able to do. So yes, for our ongoing students, we will teach them as they're writing to confirm that all of those figure descriptions are accurate and confirm all of these things as they're using Word. But if we have them put in, because they are two different um, companies, Adobe and Microsoft, if we do have them put in too much uh, accessibility in Word, then we've got to be incredibly detailed in the way that we teach them to open it and scan it in Adobe because it can wipe all of that as it tries to retag things. 
So we've decided that that's an unnecessary use of time and use of teaching for the students. And we've just said, we're gonna narrow this down to our top guys. So what we're saying is enable it. When you export it as a PDF, enable the accessibility features. That's all you gotta worry about in Word. We'll teach you to do a couple of key things in Acrobat and then just get on with your life. <laughs> Okay, so this is all conditional. Okay, so I've arrived at that decision after several qualifying things up here, and my qualifying things up here included the fact that for the foreseeable future, Ohio Link is only going to want H1s from us. And when you say H1s, it shouldn't even be plural. There should only be one H1 on a page anyway, and that's literally the, ta the, the title. So we are giving ourselves permission to not have that be in, not have heading, the teaching of headings be in scope as the final phase for the students. Now, oh no, I'm sorry. Now, next semester, once we get this, some workable workflow with this, then I'm going to create a second one pager that's for ongoing students, and we'll loop the ongoing students into our training as well. With that, I'm going to also kind of dodge the bullet in the, in the same way that we're teaching solid figure descriptions to pass for alt text. I'm also going to start by teaching them something that a lot of them are doing already, which is a clickable table of contents. When they have that clickable table of contents built in, then I can teach them much more easily than tagging and everything else to just make sure that those styles are assigned to the correct heading types. Because that's how I teach headings anyway, is thinking about an old school outline. You know, how would I separate it? What's going to be capital A? What's going to be lowercase, you know, A, and those types of things. So that'll be our second phase, teaching them to do it ongoing. Um, but until Ohio Link ups it, we're not going to have standards farther than that. And frankly, when I look about, it's tempting to say, well, they should just know how to do it. That should be part of my world. But frankly, I have a lot more things as a part of our digital footprint that are likely to wave red flags to the public than accessible ETDs that might be accessed by a person in the future. So that's how I'm just kind of triaging resources and scope and that kind of thing. Um, before we continue, I mean, we are over, but whoever, if, if you guys are still willing to, you know, um, entertain all these questions, we'll just keep going on. Yeah. I'll just remind you to repeat at least or summarize part of the question in case our virtual audience can't catch it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Emily Flynn of Ohio, and you all have done a fantastic job talking about Kent. I'll just put out a brief plug for the user group meeting, which if you're going to ProQuest, ours are at the same time, so you can catch a recording of mine later, or vice versa. We can talk about this more later, especially what we're requiring. We've left it open to the schools to customize their own to allow for a tiered approach. Yep. And it's always, are you showing effort? Mm -hmm. And so for ETDs, we've tried to make it really simple. Now for our other content on the platform, we're going with the OSU UK, but that's for other content that we've purchased. So ETDs were kind of customizing with it because it comes from our schools and we want them to jump in and out. But we can talk about this more at the next uh, session if anyone wants to join for that. But. So for those of you online, that was Emily Flynn with um, Ohio Link who was explaining that um, what we're doing works, but we're not giving the whole picture. So please listen to her for the full picture. I heartily agree. And there will be a users group very soon that's going to talk through that. Um, we will adapt as we need to adapt, but frankly, um, this is the approach that's happening at the federal level as well. If you were to get a knock on the door from DOJ or Office of Civil Rights, one of the things they're going to be asking you before anything else is what is your plan to accept, advance the accessibility of each of these different chunks of digital content. And we can raise our hand and show them the website, show them the page, and talk to them about the boot camps and, and show good faith and good effort and an effort to improve as each semester continues. And um, that's going to be music to their ears. January of 2021. Um, Can we hire you? <laughs> 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 we don't. <laughs>
<laughs> so um, I do agree with you about the auto tagging because man, you teach them to do it all over, and then you auto tag them with all their auto tags that you all the way for some reason to be in there. Start on that. I totally agree. The next thing I would say that was really hilarious, if you're dealing with the late tag, when you auto tag a document, it makes these crazy gigantic parentheses in the middle of the equation that is not a part of the equation. Like it goes straight through a number or hit my hats on or something like that. So it really messes things up. Just adds up. Um, you don't want to auto tag a late tag document at this point. <laughs> Yeah, so that was a discussion for those of you online about um, how, through her experience at Bowling Green, it makes more sense to uh, stay in Adobe for your basic teaching and then how LaTeX is, is doing things to um, math and scientific equations that um, are not that great. And again, I would go back to the triage concept, which is what we, we focus on quite a bit, and we look at scope and use. Um, we have to go through like five different conditional things. Like, is there, uh, so in order to access this one ETD and say whether it's accessible or not, you've got to have other people out here studying that exact same niche thing. It's got to show up in other journals to be, you know, triggered as something you should look at. Then it has to be a student with a disability. And for our students with disabilities, we are, we are under 8% of students who have who are hard of hearing or visual impairment. So then you get down to them needing to be in one of the 8% of each of those other ones. And then you get into them actually being a screen reader user, which not all visually impaired students are. So what I can say from going through those conditions are not that, that meeting the needs of a screen reader user are unimportant, but that it might be a good use of my resources to put information in there about how you could access, like let us know if you need an accessible one and we will convert that one very quickly for you. That's probably a better use of our resources than going through and, and remediating everything. I just realized we missed the remediating part of the question. I'm forward looking. Uh, they have to think about what's in the repository because it's like not mine. So if you guys want to talk about remediating and going backwards at all, I think going backwards is more of a challenge than uh, baking it correctly in the first place, is what I'm going to say. And I think that's been our experience. But of course, there's the scale involved with the students who have to. Yeah, so one thing we've talked about on the IR interface is having a way for people to request remediation to the item. So having this kind of pop up either in the footer or every page so it's easy for that person to communicate to us what they need when they need it. Um, and it's something we've been trying to make, you know, these benchmarks in house of adding in accessibility for our new projects. But we definitely, it's a skill set, you know, it's the biggest challenge to myself since I've been working in academics since 2008 to learn these new skills around remediation. But that's something I felt very important and crucial to the work that we've done too. I think this might be a good time to wrap up, let people go get. Yeah, there's food and drink out there, there's a better fare, and thank you so much. <laughs>